Okay, so in any ways, uh, the, the Office of Special Education established a, um, a priority to address um, uh, disproportionality in discipline. This was under uh, Director of Special Education, Dr. Eleanor White. One of the catalysts for this was that students with disabilities had missed in the 2012-2013 school year 190,000 days of instruction. Uh, actually, when the project was started, uh, that was over well over 200,000. Uh, they were able to bring it down somewhat. But that is a lot of time missed from school, obviously. And when uh, that number was produced, I think everybody was in a bit of shock. So the priority was established, and the Office of Special Education in Michigan has uh, nine or ten grant projects that do a variety of things, assistive technology and uh, autism, et cetera. And we were all asked to um, make a contribution to uh, this priority, disproportionality. So we volunteered uh, restorative justice and a cultural considerations workshop to address uh, race and gender bias in uh, disciplinary decision making, which I'll get into a little more later on. Uh, but basically, we were dealing with indicator four, primarily indicator 4A, as we were just getting started with this project. And that has to do with the percent of districts that have a significant discrepancy in the rate of suspension and expulsions of greater than 10 days in a school year for children with IEPs. Uh, part B of this uh, does have to do with uh, discrepancies by race or ethnicity, uh, but as it turned out, it was a little bit too much for us to, to handle in our first couple of years. So hopefully we will be addressing that as the project moves on. Um, now, just for a quick background for those who are not as familiar with restorative justice, it has um, really come into its own or is coming into its own in the past few years uh, because of disproportionate representation in the data. Uh, students, uh, uh, black students, uh, particularly girls, are suspended, expelled, at uh, disproportionate rates compared to white students, uh, same t with Latino students, and the same with students with disabilities in contrast to students without disabilities. Um, the, um, and as you can see here, it also affects American Indians and Alaska Natives. So this data that's been collected from across the country is pretty consistently shown that this disparity in discipline is happening uh, just almost everywhere across the country. This is an outgrowth of zero tolerance policies, primarily the outgrowth of 1994 uh, legislation uh, to address uh, violence in schools, gun violence in schools. Uh, over the years, zero tolerance was applied to lesser and lesser types of school misconduct uh, until suspension and expulsion became heavily relied on in, I don't know if you would call them routine, but more routine, more everyday types of misconduct that uh, students will get into. Um, one of the earlier discussions uh, in one of the earlier sessions, really both sessions, was what is the impact for kids and even for communities in using suspension and expulsion as a primary method of discipline. And um, one of the, some of the studies have uh, determined that even one Suspension in ninth grade can increase the likelihood of dropout by 68%. And certainly, if suspension and expulsion becomes something that as a student you're exposed to even more, 
uh, it's going to create a certain attitude towards school. And it's not going to be a positive one. Um, if suspension, expulsion, other things lead to dropout, certainly the consequences for students have to do with reduced earning power through their life if they don't get a high school education or if they only get a high school education. Um, increased involvement for, with the juvenile justice system, the school to prison pipeline. Uh, beyond that, uh, there are community impacts related to dropout. And these are some of those impacts. Uh, even, at least in one article we read, if there is, if dropout affects the labor force in your community, then you're less competitive globally. Probably your governor, the governors, our states, we always hear news stories about them going overseas, trying to attract factories back to the state. Um, that's less, less likely to happen if uh, you have a high dropout population. Um, this slide uh, has to do with a study that shows what would happen if you could reverse this situation. And basically what it says um, is that economic benefits, if half of all African American, Latino, Native, and Asian American dropouts in Michigan in the class of 2010 had graduated. They speculated, extrapol extrapolated that it would create 150 jobs, increase state, uh, gross state product, 29 million, and ha have all these positive impacts. Um, restorative justice, as was explained in an earlier session, has antecedents in native communities in, in America uh, and elsewhere around the country. It's been uh, put to extensive use in countries like England, New Zealand, uh, including the use of restorative justice in the schools. They are ahead of the United States in that regard. Um, in the United States, there are a number of programs going on in a variety of states here in Oregon, which, sorry, I. Didn't know I was coming here when I created this slide. Um, but California, Pennsylvania, New York, Missouri, and Michigan, these are the counties that have uh, schools that are using restorative justice, pract restorative practices in their programs. Uh, the evidence collected from all these different uh, areas, all these different experiences, has led the Michigan Board of Education, as with other uh, boards of education, and with the legislature in Colorado. And we hope eventually the legislature in Michigan, once it finds a way to repair our roads, which it doesn't seem to be able to do, um, the Board of Education uh, strongly encouraged the use of positive behavior, uh, behavioral interventions and supports and restorative practices. Uh, to encourage schools around the state to start unwinding zero tolerance and adopting uh, these more, uh, these more uh, restorative and inclusive practices. These are some of the tenets of restorative justice. Um, as you can see, uh, the harmful behavior that it involves itself with, that it addresses, has to do with individuals, relationships, communities. It's not only individual, but it's a recognition that harm can radiate out in the community indirectly, if not directly. Inclusion, um, restorative practices, the model, or the model that we're using, this, just like in mediation, have everybody in the restorative justice process that was affected by the harm or can help to resolve the matter. Uh, and that can include parents, that can include community members, whoever has been affected and whoever might have, whoever it touches one way or the other. 
Uh, accountability, helping students who act out, engage in misconduct, uh, understand what they've done, understand the consequences and assume responsibility for their actions. Uh, restore a sense of security to those who have been affected, especially if some sort of crime or vandalism or uh, robbery or uh, burglary or something like that has been committed. Um, and you can see the rest here. One of the important ones is respect, fairness, compassion, and dignity. Restorative practice is about addressing the student with respect and dignity and encouraging the student to understand why the student needs to reciprocate, why that is important long term. Um, and it engages the whole person and the environment. Uh, again, it can be uh, community related and the goal is to really try to change or transform a student, if not others in the, uh, others in the process, uh, towards this uh, restorative and collaborative behavior. There are two models. John English might see a certain resemblance to a slide he had earlier today. Um, the traditional approach when it comes to determining discipline, who did it, what rule was broken, and uh, what is the punishment. Isn't that basically how, how traditional discipline works? Restorative justice is a little different. The question is what happened? Who has been affected or harmed? And what needs to be done to repair the harm and make it better? Basically what that means is, is we use a circle model, get the students and everyone affected, including parents, including school uh, personnel, including community members, if that uh, is apropos. And you seat them in a circle, and you have a talking piece, which can be creative. Uh, Nobody can talk unless they possess this talking piece. You hand it around the circle. You can speak if you wish. If you wish to pass, you can pass. You can't throw the talking piece at another person. You know, it's all supposed to be civil. This basically explains the program. You focus on one speaker at a time. In the circles that are being used in our program, the goal in finding out what happened isn't necessarily to find out, to get the accurate picture, the definitive picture of what happened, because you're not creating a police record, uh, at least in the cases we're dealing with. Um, and if you've ever seen Rashomon or The Magnificent Seven, you know, you know you, you, you'll never get a, an accurate picture anyway. Or if you read, the, if you read recent events, and, and Ferguson and elsewhere, uh, amazingly enough, everybody has a different perspective. Um, so, but the idea, again, is to find out um, what happened, what was the harm caused, and what can be done about it, and then draft a restorative agreement with the student, uh, allowing the student to contribute to that agreement, because you want to draw out from the student what they think is right under the circumstances, give them what they've done, and uh, hopefully you have an agreement that the student and the school can live with and that helps correct the behavior uh, over time. So there are many benefits to restorative justice. One of the best, the students become part of the solution rather than the, the problem. Eventually, if they go into government, they'll become part of the solution rather than the problem, right? Okay, we won't go down that road. Um, students gain the opportunity to find closure and move on from the incident. As we saw earlier today, we had a student here in, in John English's um, session, and he recounted how he uh, misbehaved uh, and how this program changed his outlook and now how he wants to help others who were in the situation that he was in. And it's just this 
complete transformation and very exciting and uh, inspiring to see. Um, the, also, it helps the parents of the children who are involved make that transition, hopefully away from uh, having a student uh, or a child who may be misbehaving and not listening to someone who may be more receptive to sharing their lives with their parents, more receptive to some uh, constructive uh, support from their parents. And then again, maybe not. But it uh, depends what age they are, right? One of the administrative goals here, of course, is that classroom uh, disruptions and disciplinary referrals decrease uh, ideally, and um, students begin to learn that there are other people in the world who can be hurt by what they do. So they hopefully realize, come out of some of their uh, self-absorption. Okay, so as I mentioned earlier, the grant projects in Michigan were asked to uh, suggest what they could do to assist in uh, addressing disproportionality and discipline. So the two things that we uh, mentioned, or that we offered, were a cultural considerations workshop and restorative justice. The cultural considerations workshop is uh, just going uh, live, as it were. Uh, we're conducting it for the second time to a group of school districts in the Kent County ISD, which is where Grand Rapids, Michigan is located. And um, we've held one session out of four. And the idea there is to uh, help uh, school personnel from principal on down uh, to understand how discipline decisions get made, what can affect the decision-making process, how we come by our biases, uh, how we can become more aware of our biases, and, um, and counteract them or work with them effectively, and how we can better bring, uh, better bring to bear uh, this knowledge into the discipline decision-making process. So that's what that is all about. Uh, restorative justice, there was a reason why I showed you the map of centers at the beginning. Our services are delivered through the 18 community dispute resolution centers across the state. Several years ago, even before the Office of Special Education created this disproportionate uh, disproportionality and discipline uh, priority, a couple of centers launched restorative justice programs in their schools. One of the first ones was in Lansing, where we are housed, and uh, it turned out to be quite successful. Uh, then a couple other centers got into the same business and opened up their own restorative justice programs, and they too seem to be having some success. Now the thing about these programs was that they were general education programs, and uh, whatever data they were collecting was about general education students. They all knew that students with disabilities were coming through these programs, but they had no data whatsoever to distinguish those students from general ed students. So what we thought we might try to find out was, does restorative justice work as well and in the same way for students with disabilities as for students without disabilities? So in volunteering this idea to the Office of Special Education, we said, would you help fund this as a pilot project? They said yes. Uh, so that is what we are doing. And the way the Office of Special Education uh, arranged, they had to have their triangle. And I want to thank everybody in all the sessions before us for their triangles. <laughs> um, so we put uh, you know, PBIS, Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, is sort of the universal 
This is what all the kids in the school receive. This is a total climate change uh, approach to school behavior, discipline, that sort of thing. Then, at least in Michigan, they have some prevention circles where before anything happens, they bring students together to teach them about uh, conflict resolution and, and that sort of thing. And, uh, and so this is, this is the targeted, this is your universal targeted, and intensive, they, Office of Special Education said, restorative justice belongs up here. For those students who do not respond to either of these, still get in trouble, we're going to have them go through these restorative practices. So three of the community dispute resolution centers, one in Lansing, one in Mount Clemens, uh, north of Detroit, and the other in Grand Rapids, um, agreed to participate in this pilot project. Basically what that meant is that they already had programs going, but we were going to ask them to collect data on students with disabilities. Um, there were three school districts involved and ten schools, middle school and high school. There are two basic models that I'm f uh, familiar with to provide restorative justice services. One, the model that the centers are using is where they train their own practitioners and those practitioners go into the schools, station themselves in the schools, and when their services, when there's a student who's referred to the program, that practitioner is in the school to do the intake work and to organize the circle and conduct the circle and provide the follow-up report. The other model is to provide restorative justice training to school personnel. If not everyone in the school, then certain uh, folks in the school who are actually going to be designated to run these programs. Uh, the reason that the centers are using the first model where they provide an independent service that goes into the school is basically that the schools didn't believe that their staff had the time to offer these services. And they would rather have somebody come in rather than furnish that themselves. Um, so the, uh, if a uh, student acts out in a classroom, is referred to the office, the uh, office can refer them to the uh, RJ practitioner in the school, and the practitioner uh, sets everything up from there. And all the way through the restorative circle to helping the student draft the restorative agreement. Well, they're right. So they, what happens because of that, for that reason, and uh, because of limited funding, uh, these practitioners are shared among the schools. They they travel around. So they're only in the schools part time. Um, these local programs are funded in various ways. The general ed piece is funded in. in with Title I funds, United Way funds, Community Foundation. Um, you may have heard of the Kellogg Foundation. They have uh, supported some of these programs as well. Um, in our piece of it, where we are asking the centers and the schools to provide data on these students with disabilities who are receiving these services, the Office of Special Education is providing $250 per case to collect that data. So that's where the funding comes for that piece. Good question. So, so yeah. that's <clears throat> 250 per case. Is, a, is the special ed department offering that to the school? That to the center. To the center as a compensation for? For collecting, collecting and data, yeah, okay. data collection. This is the data that we asked for. Uh, and it's, it's, it's pretty comprehensive, we think, although we can think of additional data uh, we could request. Uh, but what we wanted at the beginning of the school year is a definition of the conduct according to the school, according to the school's code of conduct, what conduct triggers a suspension or an expulsion. 
just to establish a baseline. What we also did is we asked the Office of Special Education for suspension and expulsion data for two years previous to the start of this pilot project, so we had that data going in. We wanted the student number for all the students involved in the incident. Actually, this, some of this is going forward. What we asked for in the, in the first two years of the pilot program, the cases related to students with disabilities, the, a student with disability had to either be the perpetrator or the victim of the incident. There could be general ed students involved, but the student with disability had to be the focus, the focal point. So we got their student number to protect you know, personal, ident uh, personal identity. And uh, we asked for, okay, what, what did they do wrong? What was the penalty for what they did wrong? And then how many suspension days or expulsion days, suspension in school or out of school, were avoided through the use of restorative justice practice. What restorative justice practice was used? Basically a circle or a conference. Uh, yeah. Right, okay. right, right, um, and that was that was the that was the purpose. What we were actually finding it's often phrased, well, does does restorative justice? How does restorative justice help the student, and can it avoid suspension and expulsion? And the way I look at it is, is the school willing to accept? restorative justice and the outcomes restored of restorative practices as a substitute for suspension or expulsion. Um, certainly what we found and what the evidence shows is that restorative justice, as we mentioned earlier, has a lot of positive effects for the students and uh, for, for, the, for everyone involved. Uh, but in terms of its ability to serve as a substitute, an alternative to uh, exclusionary discipline, to me that depends partly on whether the school is willing to accept it as such. And um, at least the schools in our pilot project and the schools that are involved in some of the other programs going on have said, yes, we want to try this out. Yeah. subject to someone deciding that it's appropriate for this case to go to the diversionary program versus going through whatever the regular thing is. What is my question is, is um, are the students with IEPs, students with disabilities, being referred to our restorative justice diversionary programs at the same rate that the gen ed students are? So is that something that you guys are tracking in this well, that, that's actually going to be a piece of uh, the next two years of the pilot project, which comes at the end. Sorry. We're no, no that's, a, that's a good question. Um, what we, in, in the project that we're dealing with, in the schools that we're dealing with, they were sending all students who engaged in misconduct that, where they thought it was appropriate to go into restorative justice, and they were not distinguishing between general ed students and students with disabilities. But see, that's my question is when they decide that it's appropriate. And like, I'm really interested yeah. to see, like, especially nationally, because, <coughs> you know, we all talk about the disproportionate numbers, but then mm -hmm. when we look at how restorative practices are going to work for students with disabilities, to me, that's like one of the big pieces is access to the restorative justice processes. Because so many times, whether it's suspension or it, um, expulsion or whether it's being used um, as a diversion
diversion from after like an arrest or something in terms of the juvenile justice system, mm -hmm. like are our students and what types of disabilities are so? Yeah, that, those are things that we want to explore in the next phase. And those, uh, those also came up in an earlier, the questions came up in an earlier discussion about uh, the need for a, um, or of a discipline continuum. Uh, and if there are a lot of alternatives to exclusionary discipline, what are those alternatives? Restorative justice would be one. PBIS is one. And there may be others. And the need for that kind of um, continuum, at least in my mind, comes into play for other reasons as well, uh, which we can discuss a little bit later. But those are good questions. So as you see, we have, we have quite a bit of data. Um, the, you know, we also asked, were family members involved? Were community members involved? Uh, was a restorative agreement drafted? Uh, we originally had a behavior, there was a behavior plan drafted. And we very quickly said, well, that's going to cause a lot of confusion in special education. We weren't talking about a, a behavior plan under the IDEA. So the terminology now is, is a restorative plan. Um, and in terms of outcomes, we asked very basically, very narrowly perhaps, uh, how many in-school, out-of-school suspension days were reduced, uh, expulsions avoided, and agreements drafted. So as a, as a, just to get started, that's, that's where we started. Now, that's not the end of the data, amazingly enough. Uh, that was during the school year we wanted to collect what was going on. At the end of the school year, we wanted to know if there was enough evidence for the school to change that ba benchmark definition of what triggers suspension and expulsion. And of course, we wanted to know the numbers. We wanted to get uh, you know, your customer feedback, if you will, from the process. Quick question. Yeah. Can you just go back one? Oh, yeah. First bullet, so are you looking to see if the, the offenses that actually result in suspension and expulsion are, are the higher level? If it goes, yeah. Those willful, con disruptive conduct, et cetera, are actually diverted and don't right. result in suspension. Okay. Right. We wanted to ask the uh, uh, schools and the centers. Basically, we wanted to get feedback from them, more qualitative feedback on how the program was working, uh, just in terms of process, you know, how they felt things were going, how the data collection was working. We wanted to find out its compatibility with PBIS and other approaches to discipline. Uh, we have, you know, we have our PBIS, it's called my Blissey, and, um, you know, they're in 500 or more schools now, so we wanted to see how that was working. Uh, we specifically wanted from the schools, how does it fit in, how does restorative justice fit into what you're doing in terms of discipline? Or ba more basically, does it fit into what you're doing? And uh, has it affected, will it affect your school code of conduct and your policies and procedures at all? And has it prompted you to make restorative, the RP restorative practices part of your, uh, a regular part of your program. What we found in the results for the first two years is the 2000, 2013, 14, and 14, 15 school years. It was all just preliminary results for us. We broke down the types of misconduct. This is all related to students with disabilities. We broke down the types of misconduct, and you can see the different categories that they fell into, uh, verbal, physical, threat, misconduct, etc. cetera. Uh, this was basically if the student with disability was a victim. <clears throat> and this is where they got to the students before something happened. <laughs> so basically what we found was that 83% of the misconduct fell into four categories, verbal, physical, threat, and you know, the victimization. 
That's where most of it came from. There were 844 unique students that went through a restorative justice circle or conference. 223 in-school suspension days were averted. 2,166 out-of-school suspension days were averted. And you know, the statisticians came up with this, <laughs> a mean of three suspension days per incident, avoided per incident. So we thought that was a pretty good preliminary result. Yes? Did you gather any data on the recidivism of, of the students that interact either in the discipline assignments or in the RJ? I think we have it. I'll, I have, let me dig into our evaluation that I might be able to. And that's an interesting question. Students did go through, they do go through these uh, practices more than once. And at first I thought, okay, that means it doesn't work. Wrong. <clears throat> According to the practitioners, some students just need more time to get it. And so it's actually valuable to have them go through it multiple times. Yes? Okay, two questions. <coughs> Excuse me. For the initial referral? Yes. It was the teacher. So the teacher saw it. There, there wasn't a mechanism for a child to say, I am being bullied. And they're, and they're oh, certainly. Bullied. Yeah. There was, there was if, it's a if it was a bullying incident, I'm not sure that it went through this program. It may have. But um, the, the, actual, the actual circumstances of the referrals I'm not, I'm not quite sure of the details because these were handled by the centers. But generally speaking, the referrals were made by teachers from the class to the office. And then second, so students with disabilities who for some reason lack the ability to effectively communicate, was there any mechanism, any advocacy for them? Or were they basically just deemed to be inappropriate for this process? Well, the students with disabilities who uh, I would have to get you more information on that. But generally speaking, I haven't heard that from the schools that participate, and it's a question we should ask. Um, the, the, school, the students who were referred to these practices were students who had the communication skills to participate. Whether, students, whether some students were screened out is a good question, and I would have to look into that. Yes. Do you have the same data for all students that participated? I'm just wondering, like, how do these numbers compare to, like, the general ed? Yeah. Uh, that's the next phase of our project. Okay. Yeah. And then, did, did you collect anything on the categories, like disability categories of the students? That's the next phase of our project. Okay. If they if they allow me to come back in a couple years, I'll. Be happy to fill you in, or, or, or we, we'll give you a call. <laughs> um, OK. Um, then in, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of the qualitative data, um, there, was, uh, there were a number of suggestions. One was to introduce restorative justice to the school staff early in the program. Remember, this is a model coming from the outside into the school. But the school still needs to know what's going on, how this operates, so they'll have buy-in to the process and use it. And the earlier you start that, the better. Use RJ intentionally as a way to reduce suspensions. Um, you know, the question was asked earlier whether they do that. That was the intention of our project. But it's not necessarily understood in uh, some schools, or at least by some school staff, that that's one of the purposes of this program. So that comes with that education. This was interesting here. By including a public safety p school police officer in the RJ process, a relationship can be built between officers and the students with disabilities, and the student with disabilities can feel that they have another relationship in the building that they can count on to help solve the problem, in addition to school staff or as an alternative to school staff if school staff, if they feel school staff is not being responsive. Also, in terms of 
uh, not only train the school, but train the parents as well. And that can be done formally and informally uh, through trainings, but just through regular routine school events. Just wanted to point out one. This is this one right here. Uh, sometimes it is also good to have the process when students have been suspended as a part of the uh, as a part of the readmit process. Restorative practices and similar processes are being used to reacclimate prisoners into communities. This is somewhat analogous to that. It helps students return to class or school with issues resolved and agreements made uh, between those involved. So that, was, that came from one of the schools. Um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, one of the comments is that restorative justice is highly preferable. Unfortunately, we have only uh, services two days a week, and that makes it difficult to resolve issues in a timely way. Uh, one of the high schools in our uh, project did generate a lot of cases. And while it may, have, may not have been necessary to have a practitioner there uh, every day, all day, um, they were used quite a lot. And in this case, uh, restorative practices did not uh, prompt the school to change their, their policies. So there's, there's more work to be done. Are there any questions at this point? About it? Yes. Well, I'm just curious if you've thought about in the future, back to the comment about you know, we only had someone two days a week, if there's thought about building internal capacity in house. So the restorative practitioners are modeling, coaching up, training, building level people to mm -hmm. be able to cover that other three days during the week. Right? Yeah. Uh, the Office of Special Education, um, since they are funding a pilot project, but don't believe they would be able to fund a statewide ongoing program in the manner that we're doing it now, has suggested exactly that. Uh, developing our, the, the capacity with our, within our program to train those school personnel to uh, assume the responsibility for these for these projects. When it, we're trying to DC, we're doing some of that too. One of the things we're encountering though is like so much of it is the prep work. And so while school staff might be able to schedule in order to actually like facilitate or circle or other process, the difficult piece is that prep work. And then also the perception that it's a school person calling to get by and like from the parents and families to participate. Um, as opposed to an outside um, person in terms of the credibility and standing. Um, so, like I said, we're trying to maximize capacity in D.C. and that very well, so I'm not saying don't, but there are some really real like challenges to doing that when you get to the implementation, especially in terms of that like time to make the calls. I mean, there's so much prep work that has to happen in advance. Yeah. Yeah. But don't you find that sometimes if you're really wanting to systemically change the culture of a campus, internal would be better? Well, we're doing a lot with the like preventative circles and stuff in the classroom. So teaching restorative practices to teachers in ways they can integrate it into what they're doing in the classrooms and with students and also within the school staff themselves in terms of like a whole school like culture change piece, absolutely. And some of what we're trying to figure out this year is like which cases you could use more for the internal but some of them were significant for like suspensions, expulsions, um, you know, or the, you know, like arrest pieces um, are really running into problems in terms of trying that to be, um, you know, the internal person um, taking on that role. Like I said, just in terms of scheduling um, and credibility and then just time of school staff to, to do that work. We've got a couple of models going in Texas at this point. Uh, one is coming out of UT and they have the external model. The problem is with the external model, it's so expensive for individual LEAs to run that that is prohibitive right up front. I mean, when you're trying to come up with an additional full-time staff member, cost 65,000 plus. So I know like the Community Conferencing Center in Baltimore, they found that um, it's, that they believe that it needs to, for certain types of cases, it needs to be external, but that they also get all of their funding from um, 
like not just the school system but the juvenile justice system as well as foundations and stuff so that really is a commitment so it's not just a burden onto the schools you know, I know I know it's, it's I mean it's I mean, like we've got 1285 districts yes and no, charters I, we have to work with yes, so it's I, financially um, impossible yeah. at this point <laughs> well to quote Marshall Peter get politically involved right what we're going to do next is uh, we're expanding this to six of our centers, 10 school districts, 24 schools, including elementary schools. And uh, the major research questions at the moment, these are subject to change, are are students with disabilities engaged in specific categories of misconduct who participate in restorative practice activities less likely to be suspended or expelled than comparable students with disabilities who do not participate in restorative practices. I take it that's going to be more just descriptive. You're not actually going to do some sort of blind assignment or? It, no, I, I yeah. Mean, you know, some students go to the restorative justice and some don't within the same school. Well, uh, it could be, you know, getting back to the point that was made earlier, uh, raising the question, are some students not going to not being referred to restorative justice for one reason or another. And does that have any, does the, does, does the two different paths that are being taken have any impact on the students or the use of suspension or expulsion? So we have to track all those students. Um, and here's, you know, is there a difference in the type of misconduct that results in increased use of restorative practice components, like does, does restorative justice, is the use of restorative justice to depend on the type of misconduct? Um, and is restorative justice dependent on the type of disability? So those are two potential research questions, yes. Yeah, and that, that's what we want to focus on here okay. to make that available. And that takes a, that's going to take some specialized training, which we'd like to uh, offer. And this, the second uh, question that we're looking at, uh, are students that participate in restorative practices for students with disabilities more likely to see a reduction in suspension and expulsions than students without, who don't, do not use restorative practices? These were put together by our evaluation team. I'm not sure I fully understand them. <laughs> but we're going for it. Yeah. So that's, that's the overview of our project, a quick overview of restorative justice uh, for those who may be new to it. Um, the, uh, the use of restorative justice in Michigan, uh, we hope will grow. I think the, the Office of Special Education is very supportive of it. Um, in terms of funding, these local centers are cobbling these general education programs together. There's always a question of whether they'll be alive next year. Uh, some school districts, especially uh, the program in Lansing, which started about 10 years ago, uh, that has some very solid buy-in from the school district. Uh, including the work with uh, students with, with disabilities. Um, but you get, you know, others in the state have gone to the legislature, they've gone to the governor's office, and there are always other priorities. Um, bullying being a major priority, and there's, some folks are just not connecting the two. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to be done in terms of building that infrastructure for this work. Yes? I just wanted to echo what you just said about bullying. I, mean, I think there's a profound opportunity to use these restorative practices to address bullying. 
from both a proactive, preventive, as well as a responsive mm -hmm. angle. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to be helping people see that. Yeah, yeah. Um, right now, it, it hasn't been, you know, unless they're not classifying it as such, uh, and it's coming out in some of those other categories. Some of the uh, verbal and physical threatening kind of things. Yeah, like yeah. Um, but we might consider creating a classification for that and see what emerges from that. Um, the um, previous sessions, I thought, had made a good suggestion about Restorative practices being part of an ongoing, developing uh, field. Um, we're all involved in a conversation about it as it develops, learning from each other. Uh, I think that's a great approach. Um, if there's anything further you wish to discuss here, uh, certainly open to that. Um, otherwise, I thought uh, it might be nice, given the time and the day, uh, if you have other things that you need to do. To feel free to do them. <laughs> yes. Is there a plan to publish and disseminate your? Yeah, we uh, we have a we have an evaluation. Wayne State University does our evaluation, and we have that. It's a preliminary evaluation. We have it. I can send it to you. Yeah. Yes. And then I don't know if people are interested, or maybe everybody already knows this, but like I've um, one of the books that we're like passing out to our schools that has really practical stuff. It's called Restorative Practice and Special Needs. A Practical Guide to Working Restoratively with Young People by Nicholas Burnett and Margaret Thornborn. And it has really practical ideas for looking at different restorative practices and processes and how they can be adapted and modified for different types of disabilities and stuff like that. So it's, and it's really, like I said, really, really practical and stuff. And we are just um, Restorative Practice and Special Needs, A Practical Guide to Working Restoratively with Young People. Um, and I've just been like scratching the surface, and we're going to be like doing a working group for in like mm -hmm. NBC related to it. So like I do not know all the answers, but I thought this was like a really useful resource. There are a number. The, author? yeah. the authors are Nicholas Burnett and Margaret Thorsborn. T H O R S B O R N E. There are a number of uh, reports coming out of the Department of Education. Uh, they have an email that comes out once a month or every other month that has links to a variety of resources in this field. So you Apple might want to check that out. Appleseed does as well. Yeah. And the National, Coun the National Council of State Governments uh, has reports and tools available. So if you just do a little Googling, uh, you'll find a lot of things out there. So if there are no other questions, I'd like to give you the opportunity to get out early. And uh, I thank you very much for your participation. <laughs>